This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank uh, Gary <laughs> and, uh, and Ophelia for this uh, opportunity to come here and talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, in smell and taste perception. I would like to start by emphasizing that basically we are not a smell, a chemical census laboratory. This is not our main, our main, image, our main image in the labor, laboratory is actually sensory deprivation. And we came, we came actually uh, to the study of, of, of smell and taste via our interest in the, in the trying to understand the blind brain. So we thought that my talk today there will be two parts. Uh, the first part, which will be also the major part, is about taste and smell perception in the absence of visual perception, so particularly in the case of congenital blindness. And then the second part of my talk, that will be about taste perception and another condition of sensory deprivation, namely in the absence of olfactory uh, perception, so in other words, in congenital anosmia. So I'm going to change a little bit gears now, and I'm going to give you kind of an introduction about the congenital blind brain before I start talking about the changes that we observe in smell and, and, smell and taste perception. But I think it's important to put the, the findings that we have into the broader perspective of what the, the functional, anatomical, and behavioral changes that take place in a, in a brain that has never seen uh, in, in the life. This may be a picture that some of you, or maybe probably most of you, have seen before. This actually is represented a flat map of the macaque brain, the part to the left. And where you see that all the parts which are in color, you see in color on the images, are basically parts of the brain that are involved somehow in visual processing. And if you can, just by eyeballing, you can see that about roughly one third of the brain is involved in visual processing. Is it really and to the right, what you see is the scheme uh, proposed by David Van Essen and Koenig many years ago about all the complicated interconnections between the different parts of the visual system. So now the question is, if the brain, so the, 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 the primary brain, so obviously the sight is seen brain, the question now is what happens with this part which is in color? Uh, if somebody who is born with dark vision or somebody who loses his vision later in life, will it just be sitting there idling or this, or will it take over uh, some kind of other functions? And what does the, how does the anatomy, how does it look like? <coughs> Let's start with it by anatomy. So what kind of changes do we see in the, in the congenital blind brain? And this slide shows you a study where we did one of the first studies, so an, an, an anatomy studies we did on the blind brain. Uh, it's a vox, we call the voxel based morphometry study. What we do, we compare, we take images of congenital blind subjects and we compare them, we just see one structure images, we compare them to images of normal sized subjects. And what you see to the right of the image here, is uh, those, the areas which are colored in, in the uh, yellow and red orange, these are reductions, that's where blind subjects have significantly re a reduction in gray matter, whereas the blue areas are changed, are the areas where uh, blind subjects have significant reductions in white matter. So as you can see, throughout the whole extent of the visual system, there are reductions both in, the, in gray matter and white matter in the congenital blind brain. And as you here, you can see for particular the visual, visual area from V1 to V5, it's about a 15% reduction that we see in volume in these areas. Now these changes, we not only see changes, of course, in the, in the, in the, in the visual, the direct, the, uh, direct visual areas, but also other parts of the brain. And this is a study we just submitted to, uh, uh, for, for a review, where we look actually at the corpus callosum, and we segmented the corpus callosum for the visual sin criteria, and uh, so the last part of the brain the, of the corpus callosum, the screening, that's the area where the visual fibers pass. As you can see, when we look here at the congenitally blind subject, we see that there is a significant reduction in the volume of the, of the, of the screening, whereas the, east, the, the isthmus and the, the caudal part of the body, there we see that there are significant increases in volume in congenitally blind subject, because these are areas part of the corpus callosum, where the, the some of the sensory and the tactile fibers and the some of the sensory and the auditory fibers they have. So again, it's a pretty much nice match with the with the findings that we saw uh, for the uh, for the metric changes in the occipital cortex, visual and visual system. There's another study uh, that we did on cortical thickness. So just mentioned we had there's a, a reduction in uh, 
in the volume in the occipital cortex and the other half on the other hand we see that the occipital cortex uh, in the congenital line it's thicker that you see here in the, uh, the thick in the trees and also other, other areas outside this is an example of a study that uh, we did on the hippocampus where we see that congenital blind subject they have alteration in the hippocampus and particularly the posterior part of the hippocampus where we see the movement of changes not only are there anatomical changes, there are also metabolic changes, and this is uh, a PET FDG study, so we're looking at metabolism, FDG uptake, where we compare uh, congenitally blind subject with the situs control subject. And what you see here, the, so the more, the, the more green and yellow you see, the more metabolically active an area is. And what you see here is that the congenitally blind, this may sound at first sight very counterintuitive, but the congenitally blind subject, they have a significantly higher uptake of of meta of of FDG in the occipital cortex compared. I see very looking at me in a very surprising manner. We will look and can come back to this uh, finding later today. So they have a significant about 15 percent higher FDG uptake in the occipital cortex, which really uh, goes from V1 up to V5. So it's a very robust finding for the study we did in 12 congenitally blind subjects compared to the same amount of normal sighted subjects. And also, uh, we used also the same IDG technique, technique to look at measures and changes in connectivity. So what we did here, we applied, as you can see here, we applied transcranial magnetic stimulation of the visual, both the visual cortex. So we scanned a blind subject before they got the TMS, and then we applied TMS. And then we looked actually, of course, we compared to the normal sighted group, and we compared uh, the normal sighted group compared where there was more activation following acceptable activation. It would give us kind of an index of, uh, of connectivity of the visual cortex. And as you can see here, if you look here at this, these pictures, so these are areas where there's stronger connectivity between the primary visual cortex and the rest of the brain in congenitally blind compared to the side of the subject. And you see here, that's the posterior, the posterior part, uh, parietal cortex, including the, 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 the <coughs> so, so the sensory cortex. And you see also here in the temporal areas, you see much stronger connectivity in the in the blind brain. In the side, in the normal side of the brain, we make uh, a distinction between the two visual streams. So we have the, the dorsal uh, pathway shown shown here, which is, and we have the ventral pathway, the ventral stream. The ventral stream is actually the pathway which is involved in object recognition. Whereas the dorsal, the dorsal pathway, the dorsal stream, that's the part of the brain that's involved in the in motion and processing for finding out where where particular uh, uh, stimuli, stimuli are occurring. So we did uh, also to look at the integrity of the two pathways, the ventral stream and the dorsal stream pathways. We did the diffusion tensor imaging, and so we looked at two major pathways uh, in the uh, ventral stream, namely the inferior, inferior longitudinal fasciculus which uh, connects occipital to temporal uh, areas. Then we have the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, uh, which is actually shown here on this slide in the, in the congenitally blind subject, for example, in the late blind subject, in the normal sighted subject. And then we also looked at the main pathway in the, the, the dorsal stream, namely the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which connects the occipital with parietal projection. And you see one example here, in, again, in congenitally blind, late blind, and normal side of the subject. So to uh, what actually what, what uh, this uh, paper is now in the review, and what we showed actually is that in congenitally blind subjects there is a significant reduction in the fractional anisotropy, which is a kind of measure of the functional in integrity, uh, in that we observed that uh, in, the ventral, in the ventral stream pathway, but not in the, there are no changes in the dorsal stream pathway. But despite the fact that there are significant that there were reductions in the, in the FA values in the in the ventral stream, the fibers they could all the, the, the fiber pathways are still there and we could still easily track them. So there's a reduction but they are still there and also later on in the will come back, show the images so that these fiber pathways they are still functioning uh, active. So if we are going to summarize a little bit first of all about the uh, structural changes that take place in, in the blind brain. So first so first of all, congenital blindness causes reductions in the uh, gray matter and the white matter throughout the whole extent of the visual cortex. 
Also outside the visual system, like the hypocampus, the corpus callosum, we find anatomical changes. Then congenital blindness is associated with increased metabolism in the occipital cortex, and also with altered brain connectivity, and then finally blindness effect, effects and microstructure features of the ventral but not of the dorsal visual pathway. But still, again, I want to emphasize both the dorsal pathway and the, and the, and the ventral pathway, they are clearly observable, uh, observable in congenitally blind subjects. Okay, let's move now to uh, a phenomenon called compensatory plasticity. I'll show you an example, about a beautiful example, if I can get this one to work here. One more, one more. Oh, I forgot it. No, I was not. Tennis match? So besides the fact that uh, it looks like there are some kind of changes in the rules that you can have the ball, they can have a ball, ball and bounce two times, this was actually a tennis match between two blind individuals. So I think this is a really remarkable example of compository plasticity. Uh, it's, I mean, if I hadn't told, uh, when I saw the video for the first time, I couldn't, I barely couldn't believe it. But the, you know, the, the change is this. You hear there's a sound in the body, they put uh, some, the, the ball makes some sound, and of course they can let it uh, twice, twice drop. But they are playing like a fairly normal uh, tennis play. It's really amazing. And uh, so this actually, uh, this is a very striking example of compository plasticity, and that actually has led kind of to the idea of uh, the blind individual as kind of super performer, because I mean like this, we know also, we know for instance for, for the tactile modalities, we know there's this very strong evidence, we know there's very strong evidence for, for the auditory modality that blind subjects are actually uh, significantly better uh, than normal sighted subjects. Uh, of course, the question is, uh, what is the reason for their improved performance? And uh, basically, you can put uh, two hypotheses uh, to explain that. It can be, either it can be because they have, in, they have increased sensory experience, so they, are, you, they train more, so if you train more, they become better. The other alternative hypothesis is that's not training itself which explains the fact that they're better, but that they're actually visual deprivation. So just purely the fact that you lose one sense will automatically drive a non-visual sensory hyperacuity. And then the literature have very few studies actually where to address this question but, uh, very specifically. And the only study which has done that to, to some extent is the study by, by Wong and colleagues where they looked at, uh, <coughs> so the, uh, the test is a, it's a very simple test. They uh, use these kind of drones, which they put on the, on the fingertip, and they are either, uh, uh, you put them perpendicular or uh, at an angle of, of, of 90 degrees to the skin. And so the subject has to tell you whether their uh, orientation is horizontal or, 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 or vertical. And the results are shown here. Uh, this is the res these are the results for the dominant hand. So we have here for the four, for the for three fingers: the index finger, the middle finger, and the ring finger. Uh, the, the black, the filled squares, are the results for the blind, and the open for the sighted. As you can see, in the dominant hand, the blind subjects they outperform for the three fingers. They outperform the sighted control subjects. However, when you look at results for the for the lip that it's significant, the difference is not, it's not significant. When we look here for the non-dominant hand, again, that we see that the congenital blind subjects that outperform uh, the sighted subjects uh, for the three fingers, and uh, of course, again, uh, the, the, there's no difference for me. Uh, meaning, and that actually, it seems that it's, it's uh, not sensory deprivation by itself, because if it would be sensory deprivation, you, wouldn't, you would also probably find a difference for the nip, and the difference between the dominant and the non-dominant hand would, uh, would be 
would be kind of the same. And this is actually confirmed here when you do correl when you do correlation or look at the performance, you compare braille readers with non uh, blind braille readers with uh, blind non braille readers inside it, you see there's a significant correlation with actually the amount of braille reading. So it seems to be that this kind of compensatory plasticity that is observed is basically training induced. <coughs> Another thing which is kind of important to keep in mind uh, is the following. Uh, this is a study that we did on visual acuity of the tongue. So we looked at, uh, uh, we used the uh, sensory substitution device, the, cup, the tongue display unit, and we'll come back to that later in, in a moment. And we also measured how, if there was any difference in the acuity of, of the tongue comparing sight with the normal subject. And if we looked at the results as we, at the group level, as we pulled all the subjects together, we, there was absolutely no significant difference between the two groups. We could not distinguish the blind from the sight. However, when we started looking at uh, more at, at certain uh, uh, response categories, so we, we split the, we split the, the subject up, uh, the, the, the individuals up according to their score, we, looked, we, we found that there was a significantly higher proportion of blind subjects who fall in the, in the category of super performance. So these are the, the two, two categories with the best performers, and we see that we find the most significant uh, uh, significant difference here in the amount of blind subject in the, the group of the super performance. And we've also noticed that for some of the other studies where we find basically sim similar results. And also for the other auditory system, other, other researchers have, com have com confirmed that it's maybe not, not necessarily the whole group or whole population of blind subject as a total, but maybe a number of subjects who really outperform uh, compared to the others. This is just one example. We haven't done studies ourselves for the auditory system, but it's just a study from, from the Montreal group where they looked at increased auditory discrimination in the far space in, in congenital blind subject. So they had this, 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 the design was a sort of you had a sound source, <coughs> which was here at the, at the zero degree, and then was a second sound source, which was varied in position, and then the subject had to tell whether it was the same or different from the original position. And as you can see, the congenital blind subjects here, they outperform the sighted subject, particularly in, 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 the, in, the, in the far field. Okay, so this was basically, this was mostly what has, was known quite a lot. So most of the studies, when you look at the literature, they were devoted to tactile and to the auditory senses. But then we started asking the question, what about the other senses? So what about the, uh, the thermal sense, sense uh, the thermal perception? What about the chemical senses? And that's how we actually grew, uh, came in, coming to uh, uh, the topic, slowly to moving into the topic of the talk. First, maybe uh, briefly your results about that we found on pain and temperature perception, the study that we published last year. So, uh, where we compared, we did a study both in, a, in an, uh, our group of uh, some blind subjects in uh, our colleagues in Italy, and we had one in Denmark, where we looked at the detection for cold, the detection for warm, non noxious then we looked at cold pain and heat pain, and I also looked at the super uh, responses to super threshold stimuli, painful stimuli. As you can see here, there is for worms, uh, both worms detection and cold detection, there were no differences between the blind and the sighted, so it did not differ from each other, neither in the, in the Italian core nor in the Danish core. However, when we looked at pain responses, we see quite dramatic changes, so the congenital blind subject, they have significantly lower heat pain threshold than a significantly lower uh, cold pain threshold, or it gets a higher cold pain threshold. And again, we look, when you compare the two studies, the Italian cohort and the Danish cohort, the results are very, very similar. And then the lower part here that shows you the result, the pain responses to super threshold stimuli, the, again, the open surface of this is the, the normal side, the field surface are the, or the field uh, uh, <coughs> bars are the congenital line, so congenitally blind subject that rate the uh, super threshold stimuli significantly more painful compared to the normal side of the subject. Again, we saw that both in the Danish and in the uh, Italian population. You can also see that basically the Danish population is much more storied compared to the Danish <laughs> to the Italian, but that's probably you're not surprised about that time. <laughs> However, although the fact that we didn't find any differences in warm detection threshold and cold detection threshold, when we looked at uh, 
this uh, temperature discrimination, so we had a thermal which was placed on the skin that would, would go to a certain temperature. Then after a variable heat interval, there would be a second change in temperature going from 0.4 to 0.6 degree. You see, and then uh, we compare the two groups, we see again, these are the cumulative D prime score, so we did signal detection uh, uh, analysis, that the blind subject phase are significantly better in dis discriminating uh, temperature uh, increases in, in temperature. So it seems also that, so that in summary, it seems that also for the uh, thermal modality blind subjects, they actually are uh, more sensitive compared to normal sighted subjects. Uh, now, what, when we look at the level of the brain, so what's when blind subjects, when they are doing this, uh, all these kind of non-visual tasks, so what, what's, what happens at the level of the brain? Uh, do we see changes uh, compared to normal sighted subjects? And uh, this is basically what was one of the first studies which was published by, by Burton and co-workers, where they looked at uh, a group of congenital blinds, and they are here in this case there were six congenital blind six, late blind subjects, and they looked at brain activation during, during braille reading. And what's the, the, first, the most striking finding thing here on this slide, of course, is that the very strong activation that you see in the visual cortex in the, in the, in the, during braille reading, particularly in the congenital blind, but also to some extent, although in, not at all to the same extent, also in the late blind subjects. Okay, you can say, well, uh, they activate the visual cortex so much. I mean, Maybe it's because they're doing some visual imagery or whatsoever. It doesn't mean that it's functionally, it, it is functionally relevant. So in order to uh, address that question, we did also a, a single study, not using, uh, not an fMRI study, but we applied uh, as blind subject to read, to do some braille reading, uh, with study repetition priming, so we asked blind subject to read a uh, certain uh, word list uh, three times, and then we measured, looked at the number of errors they made, and then afterwards we applied uh, 50 minutes of transcranial magnetic stimulation of the occipital cortex, so it's a technique that allows us to temporarily inhibit activation of the occipital cortex. And then we measured look again after the TMS, or not during, so just in order to not to have, to have a confounding effect of tension. Then we look again at the number of errors, and we see now that after the TMS of the occipital cortex, the number of 12 errors actually doubled. But we did TMS over control area, like S1, or the sham TMS, we did not find such an effect. So I think a behavioral proof of the fact that the occipital cortex was functionally involved in this kind of tasks. I told you before, we have uh, two, the two streams in the sighted subject. We have the dorsal stream, we have the dorsal stream, and we have the ventral stream. Uh, we know perfectly in normal sighted subject which kind of brain areas they activate. So we tried, we wanted actually in somebody who's never seen, uh, are these streams functionally, are they functionally intact? So we used uh, the device which I just already mentioned earlier in my talk, the tongue display unit, which you can see here. This is a sighted subject using, using the tongue display unit as mini meta. So you have uh, an image which was in this case, which was which presented on the screen, because we did, of course, with the imaging set, but normally you, you connect it to a camera and then you show an object in the real world. And we devised a task which we know uh, in normal sight subject would activate the dorsal stream, like these moving moving dots here. And we devised another study, we, did, we devised a task which normally would activate the ventral stream, with pattern recognition. So we showed them four different patterns, the letter E, a rectangle, a square, or a triangle. And so that, how this works is Tommy's play unit. So the, the, uh, the device, or the camera, or this guy in case of computer, it takes the uh, it, it, it takes a picture of, 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 the, of the object and then it translates it here through this box uh, the, into electrotactile stimulation, which is applied to the tongue. Which is, so this part is placed on the tongue. This is a, basically a 12 by 12 electro grid. And what basically what happens is that you you, you redraw the image, the uh, visual image, tactically on tactically on the tongue. And uh, we have I've been subject many times myself in these kind of studies, and uh, I think some of you have tried it also when we had the workshop, when we had the, the Mies Symposium here one year ago. When you do that at the beginning, it's kind of looks, seems like a hopeless task to get some kind of bubbling sensation on the tongue. But you can train subjects, and people that subjects that become very good, both are blind and science so they, they, are, they, get, they get very good in these tasks. And as you can see here in the learning curves, so when you, after 
uh, for the six, seven, or the ten sessions, for the subject they know the asked very well. This is here for, for the motion, and this is for the shape, for the shape recognition. So, if you look now, to the, if I put the subjects in this line subject and the control subject in the scanner mobile, and while they're doing these tasks, what we see here is that they, uh, first of all, this is the result, this is a portable flat map, this is the result of the blind subject. We see that they activate the visual cortex while they do this task, and they activate motion sensitive area MT. So, this is the area in the brain that when you look at moving stimulus, will be activated. In contrast, when we, we uh, put this normal side subject uh, to the task in the scan, in the scan we see that they do not activate the visual cortex despite the fact that they do the task at the same level. In contrast, then, when we look at the task which is activated, supposed to activate the differential pathway, we see uh, very nicely, we see again that the congenital blind activate the visual cortex and that they also activate uh, an area which is called uh, LOTV, an area in the lateral occipital cortex which is actually involved in the processing of, of, uh, of object, object information. Again, that you see the, congen the side control subject that do not, although they again do the task behaviorally, they do not activate their visual cortex when doing this task. And then a final kind of very interesting uh, observation is the kind of uh, qualia that you can get uh, by activation, or, or which is related to acti activity in the occipital cortex, in the blind, in the brain, blind brain that has never seen. So what we did here, uh, we trained blind subject to use a stone device unit for a very long time, and then we applied. So we did first, we, uh, we did this, we did the TMS step before we did the training with TBU, and then we applied TMS on the occipital cortex. We do that in a normal side of the you get kind of phosphorus that kind of long kind of flashes of light. When we did that in the congenitally blind subjects, uh, of course, and not unexpectedly, they did not, before training with the, with the tongue display unit, they did not activate any, any uh, uh, phosphines. But following training, you see here, these are the areas here on the occipital cortex where transcranial magnetic stimulation afterwards uh, evoked a tactile sensation. So each point here that we see, uh, and that, as you can see, there are some of the top here on the you have a kind of tactile sensation in the back of the tongue, when you move the TMS, well, the TMS thing a little bit further, we get to the tip of the tongue. So, and this was only observed in, in a fully trained congenital brain center. We did the next study, another study, which I'm not, not sure here, but Braille really, where we saw exa exactly the same. So, we get, uh, after extensive uh, uh, priming the blind side with, with, with the braille reading, we, we found that they report tactile sensations which were referred to the tips of the finger. So let's now summarize what we have, what we have, so what the current knowledge about the uh, functional, the functional uh, and behavioral changes in congenital blind, and then promise you I will only talk about olfaction and gustation afterwards. Um, congenital blind individuals, they so show super normal performance for several non-visual sensory modalities. Uh, they seem to be in the first place due to increased sensory experience. Uh, some studies suggest that only a subset of congenital blind subjects that show super normal performance. And the basic functional organization of the occipital cortex needs to be preserved in the congenital blindness. cross model plasticity leads to the recruitment of the occipital cortex by non-visual tasks and congenital blindness. And then the subjective experience of activation of the cortex may be tactile in nature. Okay. So now, what about the uh, the chemical senses of faction and gustation? Uh, I don't think I have to spend much time on this anatomy because we have before about uh, the, the anatomy of the anatomical pathways in, which are involved in these uh, senses. So let's move. Directly to um, uh, why, first of all, let's explain why we are interested or in, why we thought it was interesting to uh, look at changes in the taste and smell perception congenital blind subject. First of all, as I also, of course, mentioned many times uh, earlier here today, we know that inside the brain there's an, an important interaction between vision and the chemical senses. This is gustatory, but the gustatory perception is strongly influenced and facilitated by vision. There are other visual perceptions influenced by infections, so it goes in both directions. And then also, we know, of course, that there are uh, uh, neuroanatomical pathways that connect uh, olfaction and, and vision. Uh, another reason is that uh, 
of course, if you are lacking the vision, olfactory and taste, they probably become more important to detect environmental hazards. Is of course a very important thing. For instance, if you need to detect, if, if you need to, de de to detect spoiled food, poisonous smokes, toxic substances, and so on, and if you cannot rely on vision, evidently you are, it's beneficial to uh, have uh, s in increased uh, uh, olfactory and uh, olfactory and taste uh, uh, capacities to know to detect these these hazards. Uh, another reason why we expect that there should be some kind of uh, why uh, some influence is that many brain areas that contain taste responsive neurons that they are multisensory. If you look at the, the neurons, for instance, the insula or the different cortex, like that. it's not that they are uniquely taste responsive, they are multisensory to a large extent. And then the final reason is that blind individual individuals then may use olfactory cues for spatial orientation or to recognize objects, or objects or persons. So the first study we did was a behavioral study uh, where we looked at uh, order perception in congenital blindness using, uh, so we had uh, a group of 11 congenitally blind and 14 matched control side subjects. And most of the studies, that's about, about the number of subjects that we include between 11 and 15, not because we are lazy, but because, because of the fact that yeah, they are really difficult to find. So we have in, in general, Denmark, we have kind of a population of about 15 to 16, but not always everybody can participate in the study. So we end up typically by studies about uh, uh, 12 to 14 subjects. But it's also why sometimes we prefer, we also go to uh, other countries like the one, the tunnel perception, go to Italy, we try to replicate this by the fact that there are no, not many congenital blind subjects. Uh, because we know what, uh, what congenital blindness cost at the time, and uh, this, this, uh, this doesn't happen anymore. So uh, uh, that's why our study samples are always relatively at the lower end. So what we did in this study, we used the uh, uh, classical test in uh, which you use in the clinic, the sniffing sticks test, which was developed by, by Hummel and co workers. And so we measured uh, all the thresholds, we measured all the discrimination, and all the and, and and uh, on top of that, we also measured uh, order awareness by the scale which was developed by the Dutch group called the Order Awareness Scale. So, uh, this shows the results, the behavioral results for, uh, to the left here, for olfactory perception. Uh, this is here. Uh, the very white are the are the sighted and the gray the gray ones they are the congenital blind. So as you can see, we find a significant difference for the threshold, and uh, it's a bit uh, paradoxically the way with the TDU, we get the highest score it means that we have a lower threshold. So you have to believe in that so it is. So uh, congenital blind says they had a lower threshold for the detection for, for detection. When we looked at the discrimination and identification shown here, there was no significant difference. But as you can see, 16 is the kind of the maximum score, so we're probably uh, very close to uh, the, 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 the may have been due to a seeing effect. And the reason being that, of course, this sniffing stick test, it's a test which is used in the clinic mostly for, uh, for assessing pathology and not for measuring supernormal performance. Um, to the right, we see here the results of the older awareness scale. So that means the, the, question, the older awareness scale measures the extent to the kind of a questionnaire of, I forgot that it's 30, 36 question or 32 questions. How much, we're just simply asking the subject to which extent they're aware of others in their environment. And uh, as you can see, that uh, here to the right, the blind subjects, or gently blind, have a significantly high score of older awareness, meaning that they are in general, they, they, they uh, tell us that they are more aware of others in their environment compared, compared to a uh, normal sighted subject. And then when we looked actually at the kind of uh, 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 questions which were, or items which were particularly significant or particularly strikingly different between uh, the congenital blind and the, and the control circuit, there were often uh, 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 questions which are related to, uh, to body orders. So that's also one of the reasons that for the moment we are actually do, doing a study of fortune. We don't have the data yet, we are just uh, starting the study. We look actually, we're looking actually at uh, the capacity of blind subject to, uh, to, dis to discriminate uh, body orders and uh, particularly the emotional component of body orders. 
So we are not the only one. There is another study uh, which has been published on multi discrimination or gender blind by the group in, uh, in Brussels, by, by the group of uh, Anne de Volta. But they basically see very similar uh, results as we do. So again, they also see that uh, the significant the blind study is significantly better. Here they, was the, they had the uh, free identification task, they had the categorization task, uh, multiple choice and discrimination task. In all the tasks, except for the multiple choice, the blind study was significantly better compared to the science survey. So much in line with all, all study. Of course, with this data, we did not find uh, a, a significant increase in free identification, but it may have been due to the fact that we use a significant value and other kind of uh, uh, test. Okay, so uh, the next study we did uh, was then, okay, so we've seen, shown now blind subjects are better than uh, uh, normal sighted subjects for, for, for smell. What about taste perception? And uh, again, uh, here we have a few more subjects. We have 15 congenitally blind and 13 sighted control subjects. And uh, we did detection and identification tracker for the five basic tastes using the sip and spit methods, which is a first choice method. And uh, the way it works is as follows. You have two glasses, and one contains pure water, and the other one con contains uh, tasting. And then in the detection task, you ask which glass does not contain pure uh, water. This is simply uh, say glass one, glass two. And then the identification task, you ask actually how does it taste. Then depending on what you put in, uh, in the bottles, you can have kind of emotive, uh, responsive. And there are different, different variations of the sick and speed method. That's, that's one that they decided not to use. <laughs> you see my, my Belgian background comes in. It becomes very obvious. OK, so we uh, had 30 aqueous uh, solutions. So we had the five basic patients. And then on top of that, we had three food-related questionnaires. So we assessed. Food near, we had the food near neophobia scale. We had the variety seeking seeking pregnancy scale, or the VASI, and the intuitive eating scale. So that's also three questions that we uh, question that we asked uh, the subject participants to fill in. These are the results for the taste detection. Uh, this is our log. These are log plots. So uh, meaning that if you lower lower scores, mean that they are more sensitive. Uh, the uh, congenital blind are here, the dark bars, uh, the uh, gray bars are the sight control subjects. What we see here actually, and this is, a bit, this is the first time we can come opposite results to all the other senses, here we see that uh, for uh, the sucrose, the salty, and the bitter, actually the congenital blind subjects, they have a uh, higher threshold compared to the science subjects. So, I mean, for the first time, actually, we find that, uh, uh, something where the site subject outperformed the congenital blind subjects. When we look then at the uh, taste identification, so we ask here they have to identify what they were tasting. There was, again, the, the difference, there was, we found the group difference, but again, it was the advantage of the uh, sighted subject, namely for, for Peter, the sighted subject will be significantly better for the detection of Peter compared to the uh, congenital type. For the other taste, I did, uh, there was no difference in identification. This is not a typo, this is just French, by the way. Um, then we also measured, so as I told you, we had some kind of questionnaires. We had uh, uh, one scale was an intuitive eating scale. And what is, what is shown here is that the blind subjects, the gently blind, they score higher on the intuitive, on the intuitive eating scale. And you see the three factors uh, from the scale that are shown here. Um, unconditional permission to eat, eating for physical rather than emotional reasons. And these were two, two, two factors that were, uh, came out significantly for which the congenital blind scored significantly higher compared to the science control subject. And then of course, uh, we had also uh, we measured the food neophobia and, and variety seek just to find out maybe how they worse because they are more neophobic to food or that they have less kind of they're less uh, they are looking less for variety in their food but they are in these uh, scales we did not find the difference between between the two groups. So if we summarize if we summarize this 
these findings compared to normal sites, uh, blind sites, we have increased, increased threshold for taste detection and taste identification. So this finding, as I told you, is at odds with severe performance of congenital blind surgery in several theta auditory terminal and olfactory tasks. Congenital blind surgery more strongly rely on internal hunger and satiety, and satiety cues instead of external contextual or emotional cues to decide when and what to eat. So we're coming from the psychophysical question is. And then the hypothesis we have is that the lower taste sensitivity that we observe in the congenital blind subject may be due to various blindness related obstacles when shopping for food, cooking and eating out, all of which contribute to underexposure of the gustatory system to a larger variety of taste stimuli. This is basically a bit what is summarized here in this slide, this one for you, Barry. Uh, this is a buying. Just imagine if you are uh, lacking vision and you have to go and uh, you have to make a food choice. It's really not straightforward. Also, when you go to restaurants, or uh, there are very few braille menus, so what you eat, you eat what you know. Or unless you have somebody sitting next to you who's going to read the menu. And also, of course, uh, there's also a number of obstacles when uh, when you uh, try to cook as blind surgery when you try to cook yourself. And I'm just going to show you here. See if we get this one to work. This is a small video of a blind surgeon we took to a supermarket. We was going to do a grocery shop just to give an idea about. So it's this braille list that he has with the ten items that he wants to buy. Device on his laptop to unless on his mobile phone. Sorry, he's trying to to. It's very hard to hold this recognition, but it may have been some beer from a weird country. It's, it's, it's a very cheap shop in Copenhagen, so it didn't recognize the brand, so it didn't, basically it didn't work. But this is actually just to really to illustrate the difficulties that you have. I mean, you see yourself before you had this list. You had this list ready before you went to the shop. When we go to the shop, we don't have our list ready. We look around, we look at, wow, these apples, they look fantastic, look at the color. Look here, this mango, this, this, this looks look so juicy. They, they, have to, they have to make their list and they have to ask somebody, okay, please give me a mango or whatever. So it's, of course, it's a totally, totally different situation from, from, uh, from uh, somebody who's in a small division. Okay, so uh, then we, did, we recently finished uh, another study on uh, where we compared auto and rich nasal infection in uh, congenital, congenital blindness. I'm going to show you this data. Um, so uh, again, so again, same number of subjects. We had 14 controls here and we had 12 congenital blind subjects. And then we used, uh, here we used powders, grocery food and condiments, so the same method which was basically uh, the, the uh, approach by Hernan 2002. And uh, we used 90 stimuli for both the ortho and the retronasal groups. And then we have uh, asked subjects for uh, So we put that to smell them, or they were, they were put at the back of the, back of the tongue. And then we asked, first asked for free identification, and then 
are following that we had for the first choice procedure we gave four different options and then we measured the percent correct responses and we measured also the correction time so the time it took them to discover to give the to give the right or the wrong answer and then also we asked how familiar they were with the stimuli that we used and you see the description of the of the blind subjects to the to the table to the right given an idea these were the kind of the the stimuli that we used, uh, just to give an example, for instance, for the orthonasal uh, st uh, stimuli, we had, for instance, vanilla, and then for the distracted lighting, we had cherry, banana, and honey, or we had onion, and then we had the distracted chai, salt, and small caps. So it's basically very much inspired by, by the other study, so we have 19 in both categories. So what are the results for this study? They are shown here. So this is the uh, free results of the free identification so we find here that there's, there's a significant interaction, a group by group interaction. Uh, congenitally blind subjects, they, uh, this is the percentage, what it shows here is the percentage of correct responses. So if you just look within group reaction, we get borderline significance. So blind subjects, they are very close significance for the for, uh, free, better, high free identification for automatically pre uh, presented uh, uh, stimuli. Whereas for the retronasal, this was basically the opposite. So this is why, when you look at the interaction between group and uh, root, uh, root of administration, we find a significant effect. What about uh, the react reaction time? So this is the time it took for the subject to identify the, the answer. And we see here, we see a significant effect uh, in the, for the orthonasal root. So the, the Congenitive blind subjects are significantly faster compared to the uh, sight control subjects in, in the free identification of the. Uh, while for the retro and for the retro nasally presented stimuli, there was no significant difference, although it went a little bit in the same direction. Then about familiarity with, with the odorants. Uh, again, we make the changes for the orthonasal and the retro nasal route. So for the uh, orthonasal route, uh, the Blind subjects, they said they, they rated them as significantly higher familiar, the odorants, uh, whereas again for the retro nasal route there was no significant difference. Then here, the odorants used for cooking, uh, we, here we find the opposite result, we find that for the retro nasal uh, 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 odors, the side subject they use them, they significantly, use them significantly more for cooking compared to the, compared to the, blind, the, the blind subjects. And then finally, we also asked for the frequency of cooking. Uh, cooking uh, and as you can see again, uh, obviously that the congenital brain cells, they cook significantly, cook significantly less the iron gray compared to the side the side, the side, the side. So if you summarize the results of this study, so we find a significant group by root interaction, congenital brain they are better than side controls for the alternate and work for the retronate the free identification task. Congenital blind are faster than cited in ident to identify other and suggesting that they have better access to store lexical information. Uh, we found a significant positive correlation between familiarity and motor nasal identification uh, in, both, in both groups. Higher familiarity with the motor nasal representative others found that in congenital blind. The retro nasal representative others are less frequently used in cooking by the congenital blind. And then finally, they can compare to uh, the Side subject, the congenital blind subject, they book as Okay, so let's now move to uh, something that I promised you earlier before to look at dream content. So, uh, blind subjects, uh, what do they what do they dream about, and uh, what do we know about olfactory and gustatory impressions in their dreams? So, this is a study that is now in, in press and which will come out very soon. We actually look at the sensory construction of dreams in congenital, and here we also included late blind subjects. So we have quite a uh, very large uh, it's a group of late blind subjects. And uh, you have Howell's continuity hypothesis, which states that the dream content is a continuous with waking conclusion and behavior. Now, if this is true, then visual deprivation should lead to reorganization of the sensory composition and the emotional and thematic content of dreams. That was the bit more that follows from Howell's continuity hypothesis. So the question that we want to ask, how does the congenital and acquired habits of vision affect the sensory, emotion, and the thematic content of dreams? 
uh, we had here in this study, we had 11 comprehensive blind subjects, we have 14 main blind subjects, and we have 25 control subjects. So how did we do? We had a green report connection over a four week period, so the, self, so the subject had asked to, to memorize, write down their dream, or write down the computer, and then uh, so collect all the information, and then to fill in a self rating questionnaire where we asked this, uh, for the sensory impressions occurring in the dream, for the emotional the thematic content, and then also for the occurrence of nightmares. Then there are a number of uh, potential performing factors that we wanted to control for, such as sleep quality, which we measured by, by the Pittsburgh sleep quality uh, inventory questionnaire. Then we also measured the vividness of visual imagery by the, visual, the vividness of visual imagery questionnaire to find out how it correlates to uh, visual to visualization. And then there was a number of components of anxiety, depression, sleep, and we yeah, also, also uh, controlled for. This is just uh, to give an idea about the, vi the vividness of visual imagery in the late blind subjects correlated with the, what we call the blindness duration index. So this is actually an index which gives you the proportion of time somebody has been blind in his life. You do that by taking the age minus the onset of blindness divided by, divided by the age. So a score to one meaning that somebody has been blind for his whole life. A score to close to zero is somebody who has become blind very early in life. And what you see here is a very, is a very strong negative correlation between the, the visual imagery, the capacity of visual imagery, and the duration of blindness. So somebody has become blind relatively late, they still have a very high capacity for visual imagery, while the more somebody has been blind, the higher the blindness duration is, the, the, the lesser this capacity for, for visual imagery. Uh, this is the number of visual impressions in the dreams uh, for this. Uh, to the left, we have the sight control subjects of basically in all dreams that you will report, or very close to that, so visual impressions, late blind subjects, there's uh, still a significant number, but uh, that's lower than in the congenital blind subject, and then you see here the congenital blind subjects, the number of dreams, so significant, there's not two other groups. And those just where I have to, uh, to mention this, because we were, might be surprised that there are still some visual impressions, but these are because we have some blind subjects who have some residual vision, some light perception, so on, and color perception. And these are the ones that reported, uh, of course, some residual visual impressions. Also, when you look at the uh, uh, correlation between the duration of the visual impression in the dream and the blindness duration, again, we see the same correlate, the same, same negative correlation. So the more somebody, the longer somebody has be, be become blind, the shorter actually the visual uh, impressions that occur in the dreams. This shows you the summary for the auditory and tactile impressions. Uh, the red one, uh, the for the three groups. Uh, again, you see that. <coughs> what you see here is that uh, congenital blind subjects they have significantly more auditory uh, impressions compared to the sight control subjects, and they also have significantly more tactile impressions. And again, the late blind subjects they fall somewhere in between these two categories. And then the slide that we'll be waiting for now, is, of course, it's going to be about olfactory and gustatory impressions. Here for the three groups, and that will also answer a little bit the question that was raised before. Uh, do blood, when do, do we do every dream, do we have uh, olfactory and gustatory impressions? Yes, we do have them, because it's for the silent control, not that much, although about, I think it's about 7% of the dreams we have, normally we have some kind of gustatory impressions. Whereas olfactory impressions are a bit more frequent, they're probably around the around, uh, 15%. Yet. When you look now at the, uh, particularly at the congenital blind subject, you see there's a significant increase in the number of olfactory and the number of gustatory impressions, yeah, impressions in the dreams. So about 40% of the dream content in congenital blind subject they contain some kind of an olfactory impression. And actually, it fits again very nice with the results that, we, that we've shown for other awareness kit, because also we, we found the clients of it at high, uh, rated high for other awareness, meaning that they're more aware of uh, what is in the environment and uh, in line with the continuity hypothesis. So it's, it's, it makes actually a very nice picture. So, conclusion of this study uh, visual deprivation significantly alters the sensory composition of dreams, the effects that we observe them more pronounced on gently blind, but they also appear in late blind individuals. In late blind individuals, change in the central uh, construction of games, they correlate with the duration of blindness. 
the blind individuals, they have fewer visual and more tactile and auditory gene impressions, and blind individuals, they have more olfactory and gustatory gene impressions compared to sighted control subjects. Okay, so now uh, some of the fMRI studies that we've been doing in, uh, in these uh, congenitally blind subjects. Uh, the first one is uh, an fMRI study published a few years ago in the Psychologia, where we looked at all the detection of genetic blinds. We had 11 congenitally blind and 14 match control subjects using eventual late fMRI. We'll not go into detail. So we presented rows of butanol and they actually they had to detect whether it was an odor was present or not. That was a very, very simple task. The uh, regions of interest are shown here. So they were basically most of them were taken from return a regional interest analysis because for older people it's very difficult to find this uh, very good, strong, significant, particularly when you don't have many subjects when you do a whole brain analysis. So these were areas we got based on the summary review of the literature we did we took the average coordinates. And as far as you can see, we included the number of visual areas, which we would normally not put into a, in, into a factory study because we had the hypothesis that the blind subject would activate the visual cortex during <coughs> the other detection task. This is here the result in the scanner. So the blind and control subject, first of all, you see the number of correct responses that there are no differences. So any purported difference I'm going to show you are not due uh, to the fact that there's difference in performance because neither there's a difference for the number of correct responses, neither did we find any difference in the intensity and the pleasantness of the steam that Oops, that's interesting. This is uh, yeah. our point. Uh, <laughs> this doesn't want to be very collaborative. Uh, well, okay, but I'm not going to send this to be to be based, but I'm going to try to reopen it. Then this, uh, what you see here, it's show here is the activation of the piriform cortex. Uh, this uh, to, the, to the left, this is just uh, for all, for all set together. Here we see this is for the uh, uh, sighted control subject and progenitally blind subject. The blue is for the odorless condition. The red is for the odor condition. You see, of course, from, from both the piriform and left and right, we see that there's strong activation during the odor condition compared to the odorless. But uh, there's no significant differences in the preform cortex between the sighted control subjects and congenitally blind subjects. However, when we look at some other areas in the, which are involved in the in olfactory processing, we do find group by condition interactions. And this is here, for instance, in the amygdala. The, one, the graphs to the left are the ones of the blind and the congenitally blind. These are, uh, this is during the other condition, the odorless, and this is here for the sighted control subject. So you can see here the. Uh, Amygdala is much more strongly activated during in the contract order compared to the list in the progenitive line. The same is true for the hippocampus left and right, and also for the orbitofrontal cortex. And on top of that, of course, we also have the visual cortex and also and the thalamus here. So it's, it's, these are so where blind subject, other related areas of the brain where the blind subjects activate more strongly uh, during uh, the order condition. We've also been doing uh, this is a study which has just been finished and uh, can show you very preliminary results. This is really work in progress. Uh, a study on taste perception congenitally blind subjects 
so there are eight subjects in it, uh, congenital blind subjects and then and, uh, 12 control subjects where we they have to uh, present to them either uh, weekly or strongly sweet stimulus, weekly or strongly bitter stimulus or artificial saliva. Uh, present them to uh, use an acoustometer and they have to uh, rate the pleasantness or the intensity of the tastings. And uh, in order to get rid of uh, potential uh, movement artifact, we removed these the scans here during the swallowing. So you get the taste in here, then they have to keep the taste in the mouse, then they have to give the answer, and then at the sudden cues, they're allowed to swallow, and then they have to drink the water to rinse the mouse, and then they have to swallow again. Okay. So it was pretty strictly controlled in terms of timing. The results here uh, for the uh, subjective ratings. Uh, of, the, of the four uh, tastings, you see there's no significant difference between the blind and sighted. So the same for the blessedness rating, so again, there, there's no confound of differences in, in the subjective experience of the only order of the uh, tastings. This is the area, uh, this is, uh, again, this is very preliminary, this is a whole brain analysis, not, as, not, not the regional analysis, just to show that uh, we actually do active, this is the area where they activate both groups, they activate gustative and gustative brain, and we see here the insula, uh, anterior insula, mid insula, which is activated in both groups, and then we also the, the post central sulcus, which is activated in uh, both groups. It was more interesting what's the difference between the groups, and that's what's shown here. We found there were stronger bold responses uh, in the uh, LOTV, uh, the left occipital area here, you see that's on the blind subject then was strongly activated this area compared to the side subject during the tasting. And this is then when we look, this is a basic similar image that I showed you before for the olfactory process, and this is now for gustatory processing. So where do blind subjects activate more strongly compared to, this, compared to uh, sighted controls? And uh, what, you, what, what you can see is that it, it was more uh, extensive throughout the whole brain for, uh, for the olfactory compared here to the gustatory. But again, this is work in process, progress, and this is, this is not finished. And uh, for the few minutes, which uh, last I would uh, tell you something about uh, uh, taste perception in congenital anosmia, so another condition where one sense is lacking and where we did an, an imaging study. And this is a, a, a study uh, from a group of uh, congenital and, and Anosmic and congenital hypothmic uh, individuals uh, from a family from the Faroe Islands, and they were, they were traced back genetically, so they are really an isolated form of congenital anosmic without any other uh, uh, consequences in, in terms of neurological function. So, in all these subjects, they were kind of they were identified in the Faroe Islands, they were flown in to Copenhagen, they were kind of really rushed through a psychophysical. Uh, uh, paradigm, and then they were participating in the national study. These are the uh, kind of demographic data. So we had in total we had uh, 12 subject congenital anosmic hypothmic. We had uh, and uh, we had uh, four of them were hypothmic, and the other of them were uh, anosmic. And we had decided to put them together in order to get some more statistical power in the end in the analysis. And the classification was done on the result on the results of the sniffing, the sniffing states test. Uh, it was the paradigm basically, so, uh, so they had to, in the, in the scanner we presented them either with sweet, salty, bitter, or, so, or solvent, and the same paradigm as I just showed you before for, for, the, for the blind subjects. And we did again, we did two analyses, we did a whole brain analysis, and we also did a regional analysis where we had three regions of interest, which we drew on the, uh, on the anatomical scans, the medial orbital frontal cortex, we had the anterior insula and the piriform cortex over so these regions. We did also a regional analysis where on top of the whole the whole brain analysis. These are the results, the behavioral results for the uh, study, so the, for the three patients. Uh, here to the left we have identification accuracy for sweet, uh, salty and bitter. What we see here is that uh, some, the congenital lines uh, uh, the congenital anosmic and hypothmic, that they are significantly worse in the, than the non-osmics non in the identification of bitter. We found a similar trend for sweet and salty, but didn't reach significance. So maybe because we never made the subject, but it was, it was significant for bitter. 
for the present and intensive ratings, basically uh, there was, although again, although we see very, very strong trends in the particular for Peter, it did, it did not reach the significance. But they were definitely impaired in the detection, the dete detection of Peter. That's why we also then in the uh, imaging analysis, we focused mainly on the responses to Peter. And these are shown here. So this is the group, uh, group contrast where congenitally uh, uh, hypos hyposmic subjects, where they, uh, for, where they activate, this is the opposite, where they, where they activate significantly, where the non-osmic activates significantly more than the uh, hyposmic and the anosmic. Now what you see here, of course, the area which is, which is most prominent here is the middle of the frontal cortex, so where the, where the uh, hyposmic, anosmic subject Shows significantly less uh, activation compared to the non osmics What we show here is the correlation between the, the TBI scores, and so the sniffing sticks, this test, and the and the ball signal responses. So this is here the two upper the two upper graphs uh, are the two correlations uh, with the, the threshold score from from the from the sniffing stick test. So we find there's a significant positive correlation between the, the threshold score and the bolt, the bolt response for towards bitterness in the medial of the front cortex and in the anterior insula. Whereas we take the whole TDI score, so we put the threshold, the, the, the detection and the identification together, we find a significant correlation between the, the, the whole TDI score and the bolt signal in the medial of the, of the front cortex. This is the correlation that we found between uh, bitter identification, the D prime scores, and the volume. This is a, was a, the VPM analysis, so the volume of activated area within the orthofront cortex. So we, again, we find significant. So the better subjects are in identification of, of bitter, the taste of bitter, the more the gray matter volume is activated in the orthofront cortex. So to conclude uh, this study, and I also to conclude my talk, this identification is impaired in congenital anosmic hyposmic compared to control subjects. Compared to non-osmic controls, congenitally blind, uh, congenital anosmic hyposmic individuals activate less strongly, less strongly in secondary taste cortex, so the medial of the frontal cortex in tasting. Olfactory performance correlates positively with increased blood signal by tasting in bilateral medial of the frontal cortex and the insula. There was a gray matter volume reduction within the middle of the front front quarter, which correlates with the taste ability. And finally, in contrast to congenital blindness or deafness, motor impairment does not seem to lead to cross model plastic responses uh, in the, the areas. So, this is just then to thank uh, all the people who have been involved, and of course, the, the Maurice Pitot has been also uh, strongly involved in all these studies. And then I would like all the students have been involved. I would particularly like to mention Lia Gagnon, who have been doing most of the manus, of most of the practical work in the taste in the taste and uh, and uh, so. Okay, so uh, I'll end up here. series of, of comments first uh, uh, underlying the, the importance of uh, Morris and Ron's uh, results with uh, um, congenital blind and anosmic subjects. Um, and, but first I wanted to uh, stress something in connection with the project, which is that the effects of sensory loss show something uh, important on multisensory perception that maybe everybody is focusing on how our brains combine uh, information from different senses, but there is probably a, a, a sense in which we are multi-sensory creators in a broader respect, that is, if a sensory modality is lacking, then the other sensory modalities are affected by this loss, and that's not really necessarily because of a lack of integration, that might be just a, a question of balance and reliance on other senses. So it is this multi-sensory aspect, I think, that's uh, has brought uh, Ron and Morris' work uh, to our attention. 
Now, um, here, uh, the, the results that were presented uh, first on olfaction show a kind of classical uh, hyperacuity uh, as, as more uh, broad uh, underscored. You have the same uh, hyperacuity in uh, touch when you're blind, or you have the same uh, hyperacuity for uh, term detection as well. So uh, the two hypotheses that were presented were, uh, quote, uh, increased sensory experience and brute effect of visual deprivation. And here maybe uh, I think that's, uh, uh, I would invite more uh, <laughs> Ron, oh my God. Ron to uh, um, uh, maybe develop uh, this hypothesis a bit more, given that's the increased sensory experience which uh, could explain the hyperacuity and olfaction for blind people it seems to be rather, in your sense, the increased importance of uh, olfaction and not really an increase in training or, you know, there's no more, there is no, no increase in quantity of olfactory experiences for blind subjects, but it's rather that they rely on this sensory modality more. So, would you accept to reformulate the hypothesis as the idea of an increased importance of sensory uh, experience? Uh, another explanation could be uh, that the lack of visual, dip of visual information during olfactory experience uh, make blind people less uh, uh, prone to associate and rely on visual cues to memorize others, and so that's where the increase of training would come. So which of these two hypotheses uh, do you favor? Now, in the uh, two uh, series of, of studies afterwards, you present cases n not of hyperacuity, but of hypoacuity in the case of text, both for congenitally blind and for uh, anosmic subject. And here, the two hypotheses, I was trying, as I was uh, reading the slides, uh, I was trying to make sense of various hypotheses. Of course, the one you present for congenitally blind is uh, a sort of analog of um, the, the uh, increased sensory experience. Uh, here it would be a hypoacuity due this time to a lack of sensory experience. And the lack of sensory experience in your uh, explanation is a lack in terms of variety. So it's not that uh, taste is less important or that they uh, have less frequent taste experiences, but it's the in term of uh, variety. But I was wondering whether the, uh, another explanation in terms of, again, uh, a bit like the hyperacuity cases does not apply in terms of contextualization, meaning that, again, you don't have the opportunity to learn and associate the taste to the visual object, and therefore that's the kind of lack of learning and training. Uh, um, not, I mean, independence of an effect of variety that's just explained the, the, the drop in taste. Now, uh, turning to the uh, also hypoacuity uh, in relative to taste for anosmic subjects, and here then we have uh, people who could maybe decide uh, on this. I was wondering maybe whether the, the explanation in terms of variety that is uh, pushed for the, the blind subject could not apply, meaning that the, the decrease in taste is due to a, a lack of variety in experience, and again, because the lack of frequency, in free term of frequency, uh, or in lack of importance, cannot, cannot really apply. But here there is, a, a, in the case of uh, anosmia, uh, I think an interesting sort of alternative hypothesis, which is the possible effect of a lack of binding. So could it be the case, and this is coming back to the, uh, the results that Lynn presented this morning, could it be the case that because uh, uh, taste information is presented only in the presence of tactile information and not in the presence of uh, olfactory ones, so you don't bind this, that the taste itself is just decreased as a respect because it's supposed to be, most of our taste experiences are supposed to be flavor experiences. The fact that suddenly they are not bound explains that there is a problem because taste is not really meant to be exercised in absence of smell. So what could be the effect maybe uh, when you have a, a missing sensory modality uh, of the fact that the remaining information does not get bound to other kind of information. So uh, that's the sort of uh, exploration of the, the variety of uh, hypotheses. Um, 
And finally, uh, I think that uh, Ron's uh, slides uh, raise a series of questions. My interest was also in the term of flavor perception and in uh, blind subjects. So, the uh, question is whether, as uh, blind, congenitally blind subjects have a, a, an hyperacuity in terms of olfaction, although it doesn't show as much in a retronasal case, uh, and uh, an hypoacuity in terms of uh, taste. Would you expect them to have a, a lesser uh, uh, flavor perception, or would you expect that by correction of weighting, they could go back? Uh, to a normal flavor perception. So turning to the sort of combined percept would be your predictions. And finally, uh, the, the third uh, series of questions turning more to your specialty on, on the, the cross-model plasticity. So as you as you shown uh, in this beautiful series of studies, there is a, a sort of generalized plasticity in the congenitally blind brain. Uh, and the, the same is not true uh, as uh, you showed for other sensory loss. So we don't have the kind of plasticity in the kind of anosmia. So uh, I would invite you to maybe develop a bit here on this explanation. Is there a, a visual privilege in terms of plasticity, the privilege of the visual cortex in terms of plasticity, and why is it so? Okay, let's uh, have well, uh, <laughs> a lot of questions. Uh, so let's uh, start with uh, your first remark about uh, the lack of uh, concept plasticity in, uh, for the, for the uh, anosmia. I think the reason why, I mean, if you look at the amount of cortical surface which is really uh, dedicated uh, or involved in, uh, in, 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 in taste, in taste or in all the perception. I mean, it's uh, of course significantly less compared to the visual part of the I showed at the beginning. It takes about one each one side of the brain, uh, so it's a huge amount of cortex. So uh, it's kind of from from the from the survival point of view, it makes sense that if there would be kind of compressor plasticity that would kick in, that would have it's much more important for for for, for an organism to have compensatory plasticity when you have. Uh, uh, an important sense such as vision, which is lacking, which is really crucial in terms of uh, uh, survival, particularly in a, in, a, in a modern society where it's, you would lose your sense of, of, of smell or you would lose your sense of, of taste. I mean, it's, uh, it's much easier to, uh, to survive com compared to uh, the dramatic effect that you have when you would lose your, your sense of, of, of vision. That's, that's a big difference. So I think that might be one of the reasons why we don't see these kind of compensatory plasticity. And I'm still wondering whether this compensatory plasticity that is observed, I mean, it's, when you look at the nature, it's mostly observed for the visual system. Even if you look at the all the studies we have been done on congenital deafness, of course we know that there is also that they activate uh, the auditory cortex during, during lip breathing and so on. But then we have been looking now at that some, uh, we did also a study in congenital deaf subject, we look at the anatomical changes that take place in the congenital deaf brain, they are much less limited compared to the visual system, so I really want to have this, uh, something which is unique to, to the visual cord, to the visual cortex, uh, I mean also the, the change in, the, in glucose metabolism in the, in the, congen in the congenital blind subject, we don't see anything equivalent in the congenital deaf brain. So it might be that maybe because we are primates uh, and uh, the, the relevance of our vision is, is, is very high for us, that that's maybe, maybe explain why we get such a you know, non amount of post uh, uh, when you, when, you, uh, when you lose vision. Uh, to come back to the results of the taste, I have to admit that I kind of we, we gave the explanation that uh, limited access to uh, or limited access to a variety of foods that that might be one of the uh, possible explanations uh, for the for the findings that they have uh, that there was in uh, that they have lower or higher uh, identification thresholds than there was in identification. But then on the other hand, I mean, I'm not very thing now really, 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 really retrospectively really to this hypothesis we put in the paper. I'm not sure if it's really, if it explains everything, because we use, we actually tested with very, for, for the basic tastes like sugar, salt, bitter, and sour. I mean, normally, even if you don't have like uh, 
tasted 50 different types of, of, of tea or, or to, uh, I don't know the big wine, but normally should still be sufficiently exposed to different basic tastings. So I'm not, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled by uh, the findings of the uh, taste results. And of course it's only down in 12, I'm not saying that uh, this is wrong, so it has been very particularly uh, very, very, very precisely conducted, but it is uh, only one study, 12, 12, 12 for gently blind subjects. It is a very tough procedure in terms of it's a very long and tedious procedure. It takes about two and a half hours maybe to, to get both taste identification and taste threshold. So I'm trying to uh, convince some of our colleagues uh, who have other uh, groups of congenital blind subjects to find out whether they want to find out whether they want to replicate and see if they get the, the same findings as, as we do. Uh, because, I mean, again, the uh, variety seeking, I don't think it, it may, may be strong enough to, to give a real convincing explanation why they have higher thresholds for the based identification than the side subjects. It's all right, I'm going to pass some questions up to the floor, which maybe mm -hmm. will bring up some of the fears that have been so very first. So two quick things about the yeah. hypoacuity with uh, taste and, and mega difference between the cases. So I mean, you necessarily you had a small number of subjects, so statistically it's, it's yeah. tricky. When testing them for their taste sensitivity, just giving them proper PTC, just to find out where they start from, and also where the, the uh, cited where the cited group are, just just so that you have that measured out because you've got such a small sample. Yeah. Over a bigger bigger sample, you do that. But on the on the um, hypoacuity of taste in congenital anosmia sufferers, um, I think there's a problem here mm -hmm. because although we believe that uh, salt, sweet, sour, bitter are just just tastings. There's some work by Mojet and others in Ed Costa's lab suggesting even, even these have got some um, olfactory, uh, retronasal olfactory qualities too, so that if you get normal subjects and you give them nose clips, you also get a drop in sensitivity and detection for the basic tastes. Now, if, if that's true, that also might help to explain why people, when they lose their sense of smell, often don't notice that they still can taste, because the tastants, as an experience, are not doing the same thing they usually do when they've got intact taste and smell. So it would be worth having a set of controls and um, just looking at them with those clips and seeing if you get the same level of dip, and then I think you've got your answer. It's going to be an expensive experiment. <laughs> and to go to Farrah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, good, that's a good suggestion. I have a very related question, yeah. and then I have different kind of idea in the sense that, and at first when you mentioned that, well, you know, those blind subjects doesn't have any different sensitivity in taste and retrenchal affection. Well, I thought at first, well, it's not surprising in a way, because the visual senses, disco sensing, and then those who we're talking about taste and retromedial smell are not disco sensing. So why would that affect? That's what I thought at first. But then I also started thinking, well, but then that is not relevant in life, in a way. Because when we, when we think about taste and smell, it's no longer threshold level. But if once you make a decision to, okay, I'm going to eat this food, and then you are not no longer looking for threshold level. We are thinking about super threshold level. So I'm not sure measuring threshold is any relevant here to me. So what if, if you're measuring, so what is relevant when it comes down to eating is then changes in concentration. So it's like psychophysical function is a lot more relevant. So can we detect, in terms of sensitivity of changing the differences, do they need different? I almost wonder that might be the case. So by measuring psychophysical function, mm -hmm. we might see differences. 
I'm not mm -hmm. certain, but that would be my guess. I, you, the, the difference in, in psychophysical function is relevant, but doesn't mean that the threshold uh, difference is not relevant. The right thing actually is you have some there's some indication from our work on the, 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 the temperature right. sensation where you see the same thing because uh, if you look at the thresholds for 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 for, for cold and and, and, and warmth there was no difference between the two groups although if you remember we had another ta task where we asked for discrimination changes in the, there we did we did find right, a clear right. difference so that would argue definitely for what you were saying now right yes. there would be a lot more relevant yes. in it and then some of the later on you used to um, measure the intensity of taste but then still the range of concentration is much lower than mm -hmm. what is common in food mm -hmm. so like for example sucrose you had like 0.1 to 0.2 range that is not any strong when you come down to food. I mean, when you come down to food, it's you know point one to point five. That's the range we're talking about in food system. So if you measure that different range, much a lot bigger range, you might see uh, different sensitivity. And I think that's a lot more relevant. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna we can carry on that particular topic maybe a bit later, but just to get a bit more of range, can we go to the back maybe and get a couple? Of Hi, yeah. Um, I'm an acquired anosmia sufferer. Um, I lost my sense of smell in 2005, but um, it's really over the past couple of years I've become aware just how sensitive and nuanced my sense of taste is to the point where um, if you were to say give me three cups of three three cups of espresso made from different beans, say a, a South American one. Uh, a, a, an African one, I would be able to tell the difference between them all based on inherent levels of inherent balances of bitterness, sweetness, and sourness within each one. So I believe there certainly is, on my own experience, there is very much an opportunity to sort of explore and you know, in terms of hyperacuity in, in taste for anosmia sufferers. That is there, but the problem is um, education. And this goes back to some of the early things we've talked about, about the difference between taste and flavour, because most um, anosmia sufferers report that they have lost their sense of taste as well. And because there's this whole lack of awareness generally about what taste is, and that that is actually an overall part of, of flavour, although you know, we've, we've also discussed today what, what flavour actually is, as Barry's looked into. Um, I think with the right sort of tools and, and, and teaching, there's the opportunity for more anosmia sufferers to actually become aware that their sense of taste probably is more um, sensitive than, than most people's. Um, but, you know, there's a study waiting to be done there, I think. These were, of course, these were congenital anosmics. And you said that you, does that mean difference yeah. of you losing your, your, your sense of uh, uh, smell? Uh, at birth or later on in life, maybe you kind of compensate because I don't know, but there's a difference, there's a different uh, group of subjects that we studied. Yeah, but it's, I suppose it's one of those things where it'd be, it'd be interesting to look at congenital versus acquired mm -hmm. and see what the, see what the difference but, is. But one of the things you said that, that it's interesting, even though people confuse taste and flavor for the reasons we know and that uh, Joanne was talking about earlier. It's surprising that they think they don't taste anything. And most, I mean, as Carl knows, most people report, they present as, I don't taste anything. And it's a surprise to them when you give them salt in the tongue or sugar that they, how, why is that? I mean, yeah. that's not about a linguistic confusion. That's not identifying parts of your own experience anymore. Yeah, yeah. So and when I, think, I actually, when people email Fifth Sense, and that say, I can't smell or taste, and I go, well, when you say you can't taste, can you detect sweetness, sourness, or yeah. They go, oh yeah, well, I can get that. But then one of the things that someone has said to me is that, well, they're just basic sensations though. Right. But what does, what does, you know, what does that mean, really? Yeah, uh, <coughs> in general, I, mean, I had a patient came to the clinic one day, she was very angry, and she arrived at me that I let her go through a series of olfactory tests and asked the questions about olfaction. I hate because I can't taste. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> and I was actually, no. I said, then your test clearly shows that actually you're uh, an osmic, and it's not a problem with your sense of taste. I mean, you perform very well on that. 
Um, I, I, have, I had a specific question myself, actually, just um, on your congenital anosmics, because you yeah. sort of put um, anosmic slash hyposmic. And for me as a clinician, I was just sort of intrigued as to whether that meant there was a heterogeneous group of individuals, or whether there were all specifically ones that had MRI scans showing hepatic olfactory bulbs, and obviously, because you, you had some, I, I didn't get all the TDI scores, because it was quite... I mean, there's the yeah, scores, but there were used criteria that I think they were proposed by people to classify them in uh, hyposmics or, or anosmics. And the, simple, the only reason why we merged them together because of the group had to, get, to gain statistical power. That's the only. I would have much preferred to have to keep them separated, but uh, I mean, then we were only at eight subjects that uh, was not enough to get some, 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 some significance. Okay, we'll have one last question. Okay. I, I'd make two comments. First, what you said about taste is very interesting. Um, we're still really kind of in the backwoods of understanding respiratory physiology. And you can take a dozen different complex carbohydrates from fructose to maltose to lactose, and they may actually be inducing different, let's say, sweet percepts. Um, so you may have a taste receptor, but they may be tuned more differentially than that. And you know, I think we're learning there's a lot more complexity to the taste system than we used to think. And what you're saying yeah. really speaks to that. Uh, sweetness, for example, there, to me, there are different types of sweetness. That you know, when I say to people, well, veg some vegetables are sweeter than others, and it's it's not the flavour, it's the sweetness itself. But you know, have, to, have to sort of describe that is obviously quite difficult. But you know, I, I see a decent number of small ox patients too in my clinic, and they come in and always say they they can't taste and. I kind of dismiss them outright, and then I go through the testing and say, well, see, you can appreciate salty sweet, but I think what we're hearing today is that any kind of oral food experience, it's a two-way street. I think it's not only that, I mean, we saw some nice data today suggesting that um, taste may, may inform and enrich your olfactory sense, but I, but I think the other direction is true also. So I think I'm guessing that there there can maybe not a you, but there there may be an actual alteration in taste perception also, which is dif just difficult to um, test and identify. Um, well, Mujit's right, and there is actually just a little bit of smell even in some of even just giving people the pure stimuli that are supposed to be just taste nice. That'd be different, right? Okay, this was a very, very last question, otherwise nobody's going to have cake or cheese in a few seconds. Okay, <laughs> nobody will have tea. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be really interesting to study if we congenital anosmics uh, can distinguish better textures of food, because perhaps this is what is important for us. Mm -hmm. So, I think it could be a nice experiment. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Come to Barcelona. Oh, I'd like to say one quick thing related to this. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't even have tea. I've been very quiet. I'm not very, very quiet, so I've, I've been good. Um, and I've not written down on everything, but um, I, I suppose I had a question because uh, it's always linked to your poor taste results, which I apologize. You've got so much other stuff up there. But um, So if increased tactile sensitivity using your tongue motion mm -hmm. machine and decreased... In the subset. Yeah, no and your decreased taste sensitivity are in fact both being manipulated by the same thing, which is that developmentally speaking, these congenital blind individuals are having a much more intense or much more important um, uh, neonate young infant form and object recognition through their mouth. So obviously, through the early months of infancy, you're using your mouth to do object recognition and form. Maybe if that's if you're having plasticity at all during that phase as a congenital blind individual, it may have a, a later effect on taste because your tongue now is not just uh, for object recognition in, uh, in non-blind people. Obviously, it's taste and object recognition. But in visually impaired individuals, you've, you've used your tongue a lot more. They sometimes identify objects by putting them in their mouth. But yeah, 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 actually, we have one one so study who that was the first thing that. They, but when he participated in the experiment with the tongue spinner, he was extremely good. 
And I just started talking about it to him afterwards, and we said, well, how much of a friend's people are with performance? He said, I'm not surprised. Said, because when I was young, I, if I had to find out a, uh, to find out a particular school or whatever, he needs to put it in his stomach and put it with the explorer. Yeah. For infants, yeah. that's yeah. the case for all women. Yeah, but it would be more important for visioning head child yeah. to yeah. let keep on yeah. using this, and so yeah. taste might be less important. Mm -hmm. So taste needs to be much more related to that. Where you can taste differences between different screws. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, have some biscuits and coffee. Thanks, thanks a lot.